So this is the um, one of the most important lectures on, on the theory and practice, well, actually on the theoretical part of the finite element method. And it's the Denis Lyon lemma and the bramble Hilbert lemma. So uh, Denis Lyon is a part of the bramble Hilbert lemma and, uh, and it's going to be, uh, we're going to spend quite some time in trying to figure out exactly how this is uh, proved in the finite element method and, and, and what is this, uh, what is this application for, for finite element theory. So let's go with a very short recap of what we did so far. So we started with the, the definition of the finite element spaces as a triple of uh, a reference element, a reference finite dimensional space, and a reference set of degrees of freedom. And according to whether you look at the degrees of freedom as the functional or at the degrees of freedom as the uh, actual numbers that come out, this is a uh, um, it may be the values, for example, for Lagrange finite elements, the values of the functions at the nodal points or the direct delta distribution centered at the points. So depending on the various features we look at. And we saw how to define, for example, Lagrange finite element spaces as the spaces in which the, the nodal basis functions, that is the basis functions for the dual space of the finite dimensional space P that we're looking at are the direct delta distribution centered at some super points. Those were the super points that we saw for Lagrange and finite element spaces. And uh, we saw some examples of, the, of these guys over here and we defined the actual basis functions as those functions which are in the local space such that when you apply the nodal basis functions to the basis functions, the i on bj, you get delta ij, the character delta ij. So that's equal to one or zero according to various things. So in other words, those are the polynomials if you look at P, which are polynomial spaces, those are the polynomials that are equal to one on one of the super points and zero in all other super points, and uh, respectively one on these super points and zero on all the others and so on and so forth. And we saw some of these examples graphically in the planet element library deal too. Now, once you have defined this on a single reference element, you define a triangulation tau h, uh, which for our purposes at the moment is exactly equal to omega. So we are assuming that omega is a polygonal space. And you define a triangulation tau h as a union of Tm, where Tm are um, triangles for, for our purposes at the moment, but quadrilaterals or hexahedrals or, or in general, uh, simple functions, so simple simple objects, simple simplices or simple uh, hypercubes or hyper, hyper squares. And for the moment, we assume that these are uniform, so we don't consider mixed uh, triangulations, so mixed triangles, quadrilaterals, or mixed hexahedrons, hexahedrons, even if this is possible and it's not much more complicated, you just have to have different types of reference elements, different, different types of reference finite elements and to have this work correctly. Once you have defined uh, the, the triangulation in this way, so what you need to do is you need to be able to transform uh, back and forth from the reference triangulation to the uh, current triangle. So from the reference element T hat to the current triangle Tm for every M in the, for every Tm in triangulation and you see over here. And uh, we assumed for, for the theory that this, these transformations here are affine so that life is a lot easier if you have this as affine triangulations. And as soon as you have this Fm at your disposal, then you, you can define a local finite element space on Tm as the triple Tm, Pm, uh, Cm, and, and this sigma M. And this triple over here is uh, obtained through the push forward through Fm of the triple that we had over here. So in other words, you see Tm as a transformations under Fm of T hat, and you see V high as the uh, composition of V high hat times the inverse of Fm of Fm. Once you obtain this, you go to a global space, which is V, v capital VH, as the span of the basis functions VI, or I that goes from one to n dots, through a global numbering object, which is constructed in order to make sure that every functions that you have constructed in this way actually belongs to the space that you want to approximate capital V. So typically, if capital V is H1, then you want to ensure that VI is continuous and you can choose P, M, I, J, in such a way that this is satisfied. And in other words, the way to construct the global basis functions is by extending by zero the local basis functions outside the n triangles. 
and um, I extend by zero Vj hat composed with Fm inverse. And this gives me a uh, portion of a global basis functions. And then by summing over this Pmij Vj composed with Fm inverse, I get the global basis functions Vi. And this object over here is a uh, global local to global indexing or lo global uh, to local indexing such that it's equal to one. If you take the global basis functions Vi and you restrict to Tm, you get the local basis functions Vj restricted um, composed with Fm. Otherwise you get zero, okay? So this is the global, um, global space. And uh, once you have this, we constructed the properties of the global space by looking at the properties of the affine mapping that have been used element-wise. So to, this, to describe the affine mappings, uh, this for linear mappings, you can simply choose Lagrangian P1 finite element spaces. So P1 of T hat is the span of V I P1. This is the way V hat I P1. This is the way that we would define this. Then you can write, the affine transformations bfm equal a matrix constant matrix bm times x hat plus b and this is constant because it's an affine transformation and so this is a vector which is constant for every m sorry this should be fbm of course and uh, once you have this affine mapping which can be expressed explicitly by writing the p1 basis functions multiplied by the actual location of the vertices AI, you obtain the mapping for TM and the mapping for TM has some nice properties. So if I look at the vector that joins, the, the, the segment that joins two arbitrary points in the triangle X minus Y, I can exploit the fact that uh, if I take the difference of Y minus X and Y hat minus X hat, I can express these differences as uh, applications of the matrix P, which is Jacobian of FM to C hat and to C respectively, so B C hat is equal to C and uh, B inverse C is equal to C hat and exploit the definition of the norm of B using the uh, induced L2, L2 norm uh, of B in a certain sense, little L2 by taking the vector in Euclidean norm, uh, the distance in, so the, the actual norm, the, the actual Euclidean norms, so this is the length of the vector X minus Y. And uh, I see that the length of X minus Y divided by xi can be split, can be written in, in the worst possible case scenario as something which is certainly smaller than hm over uh, rho hat. And when I define rho hat, the radius of the inner circles and the diameter of the element as hm. And, and when you have these two properties, then you can, you can bound the norm of B with hm, with a constant time hm, and the norm of b inverse with the constant times rho m inverse, rho m to the minus one. Then after this, what we have done, we, we, we started by looking at the transformation of Sobolev norms under affine mappings. And the transformation of Sobolev norms under affine mapping comes simply by uh, the definition of the Sobolev norm in uh, in, the, in, the, in the domain Tm and transforming this domain Tm to T hat. So if you do this, it's, 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 it's quite simple. So you define the DK of, of V hat times Fm inverse. And thanks to the fact that Fm is a fine, this can be written as V hat of, of K of V hat uh, times BK, BM to the minus K. And this is exactly the definition of the uh, kth derivative of the composed function we had uh, after f and inverse. This is just the chain rule for vector variables. Um, and and uh, if you look at this in this way, then of course, this is a constant matrix. That's, that doesn't change when you change uh, the domain of integration. You can change the domain of integration here and there's a JM that pops up. And now this JM is a determinant of B. So in a certain sense, uh, all of these are constants. So you can take them out of the integral and you are left with the part which is over here and uh, the part which is over here, which is exactly the norm with respect to T hat of V hat. So I can transform these norms into these norms simply by the push forward and the pullback with respect to the FM map. And if I do this twice, now, since from now on, I'm going to use a lot of, uh, 
inequalities with a lot of constants. I don't want to write the constants all the times and specify that this is a different constant with respect to the other constant. So I'm using this notation, which is typical of analysis uh, articles. And the notation is uh, with, the, with, with the minor and the tilde below, below the minor says that there exists a constant which is independent of all the arguments that appear in the various things on the left and on the right, uh, such that A is more or equal than a constant B. And uh, I, I often write also um, the, the notation A is equivalent to B when A is smaller or equal than B and B is smaller or equal than A. And typically, for example, this is used for equivalency of norms, but it is two constants that you can use to control from the law and from above uh, the two norms, okay? Okay, so uh, with this notation, what we have just written above can be simplified as uh, writing a equivalency between the norms after composing with FM inverse with the norm on the reference element. And you have two terms that appear, which is rho m to the minus k, and hm to the power k according to which direction you choose. So if you go in the one direction, then you control this norm um, with respect to that with this constant. And then one exploits that uh, for, for all finite dimensional spaces, what you have is uh, an equivalency between the norms where you can actually explicitly state what the constants are. This constant depends actually on the grid uh, dimensions on the triangulation dimension. And now here's where life becomes interesting. And this is a, this is the very recap for, for very short recap of what we did in the last lectures. Uh, now we would like to exploit this for our finite element interpolation errors. So we would like to write the interpolation error, we would like to write the error, the approximation of the finite element method, exploiting this type of relationship that we have just constructed for uh, for polynomial spaces. Okay. So in order to do this, what we obtain here is the, uh, so, well, the, the most famous result that should be used in this case is the so-called uh, Blambolibert lemma. And the Blambolibert lemma can be stated in the following way. So Bramble-Hilbert, And this is the plan for today's, today's lecture. And uh, will contain also some details about, uh, about the Nilion lemma, which is used inside um, to, to prove the actual Bramble Hilbert. So Bramble Hilbert says the following way. So let tau be a linear operator. Between the space, um, hk plus one, actually let's use this Sobolus basis for this particular example, wk plus one p of omega into uh, w s p of omega with s smaller or equal than k. Then Bramble-Hilbert lemma states the following. Um, if PK is included in the kernel of tau, in other words, tau is zero on all polynomials uh, of order K, then one can write the following statement which is tau of u and tau goes from wk plus one p to wsp. So this is a sp omega. So if I measure uh, the norm of tau applied to a vector u, this object is smaller or equal than the operatorial norm of tau. So this norm is actually the norm of W k plus one p omega W s p omega, and then on the right we have. Let me move this a little bit on the left. Here, 
we have as a result u k plus one p on omega. Now, what this is telling us is that if you observe the structure of this object over here, and you think about uh, the application to finite element methods, the application to finite element methods would be useful, for example, if you had tau, which is the identity minus a projection P on the space K, on the space PK. In other words, you have uh, you 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 should be you will be having something that tells you how the error between u and the projection on the polynomials of u, and this will tell you that this is smaller or equal than tau. Let me simplify this with just simply tau star semi-norm of u k plus one p omega. Well, this doesn't seem too powerful, but if you think about the way that we've defined the finite element spaces and the, the property that the first property that we gave to the finite element approximations, we had that the finite element approximation, the error in the finite element approximation was smaller than the infimum of all possible uh, uh, of all possible functions in the finite dimensional spaces that you had. Well, the, the different the infimum between u minus all the h for all the H in the capital V H space. And now if you can write the capital V H space as a patch combination of polynomial spaces and you recover something like this for every single polynomial space, then uh, you will suddenly on the right, the right hand side, you only have uh, something that depends on tau and it does not depend anymore on the particular type of, of, uh, of functions U H that you have and something that depends on the semi norm of U. So you, you get rid entirely of the approximation that you have here on the left. And of course, this is very powerful because if you can prove that this goes to zero with some powers, and just to give you a hint, this is exactly what we have proven here for every single element tau. If you, if you can choose uh, the K on the left and the L on the right, such that this guy's over here uh, goes to zero with the power of H and doesn't explode. Or so for, so for example, this is true whenever you have a K which is strictly smaller than L on the right. And what we have shown here, what we will show is that when you obtain, when you when you look at this for, for, for finite dimensional polynomials, so for polynomials on, on local spaces, then you end up with the, with the term that goes to zero with the correct order of, uh, of convergence on the right. Okay, so this is the way, the reason why one would like to use this type of results. So this result seems uh, not too powerful if you look at it in this way, but in reality, it's telling a lot of the very interesting things. So let's start with a um, with the first step. So step one, and so, the, so the proof of this requires two steps. First step, show, and this is actually a more general result with the respect we had before, uh, that for any tau in which is linear between the space V and the space H uh, such that Q is equal to the kernel of tau, we have, and this is a trivial consequence of uh, being the definition of the kernel of a linear operator, we have the following property. We have that uh, the norm of tau applied to U, this goes into space H, so this is the norm H, is uh, by definition equal to the norm of tau applied to U plus an object which is in the kernel. So we call this P on H, and this is to be valid for any P which is in the kernel of tau simply because tau is linear and P is an object for which tau is equal to zero, okay? And of course, this is more or equal than the norm, operatorial norm of tau and the norm of U plus P in V. 
by the definition of tau being a linear operator. And by definition, that means it's bounded. And this is the actual uh, norm of the linear operator. And of course, this is to be valid for any P in capital P, okay? So what I'm saying here is that this is a general property And it's saying that, let me use tau star here. I can take this to be the infimum for P in the kernel of tau. And this is for any U in capital V, okay? That's very simple. And of course, it's not the same thing that we had above. And the reason why it's not the same thing that we had above is because above what we have is we have the semi-norm UK plus one in P omega, okay? So in some sense, we want to show that for some specific choices of the spaces that you have over here and from specific choices of the spaces that you have over here, this infimum is equivalent to taking the norm, uh, semi-norm UK plus one. So the second step, Step number two is actually called the Benilion lemma. And the Benilion lemma is telling the following things for you in W K plus one P of omega, the semi norm U Excuse me, K Professor. plus one. Yes. And um, please, can you move the slide a little bit upward? Upward, uh, uh, this way? Yes, you take P in V, but uh, P, um, P should not be in Q because Q is the kernel of uh, of tau. Because you see that tau of U, the norm of, of tau of, of tau of U mm -hmm. is equal to the norm of tau of U plus P. Yes. But this one to work. Uh, uh, sorry. Of... So you're right. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. For every P in Q. Okay. Sorry. That's for every P in Q, of course. Of course. You're right, sorry. This is for every P in Q. So for every P in the kernel, of course, and, and, and the line below otherwise wouldn't have made any sense. So for any P in the kernel, you can choose the infimum for P in the kernel such that uh, of this norm over here. Sorry, thank you very much for, for pointing this out. Of course, this is for every P in capital Q. Okay. This is a general property. And now in order to prove the first part of the, so the last part of the bramble effect lemma, one wants to once wants to show that if you take U, which is in W K plus one of P, then the semi-norm U K plus one is equivalent to the, uh, this is called the quotient norm with respect to Q, with respect to P. And uh, let me let me write this PK of omega of the norm of U plus, uh, sorry, this was P everywhere. So let me use P everywhere. This is P K plus one. P. Oh, that's why I was using Q. Let me see, let me change this and use Q here. Otherwise I confuse the Q with the, with the semi-norm, with the Sobolev index that you have here. So this is P Sobolev index, sorry about that. So for you in WK plus one P, we have that the semi-norm K plus one P of omega is smaller or equal than the infimum of Q in PK of omega U, U plus Q K plus one P omega. And we also have that this is valid on the other side, so that this is an equivalence norm. Okay. 
And this part, the second part, it's a little bit more hard. It's a little bit harder to prove than the first part. Well, the first part is trivial. And the reason why the first part is trivial is because if you take a polynomial, which is in PK, uh, the seminorm K plus one P of UK, if you take the K plus one seminorm of a polynomial in PK, that's equal to zero. Okay, so first inequality. We have U, K plus one P omega, smaller or equal than the infimum of Q in PK of omega, um, U plus Q, K plus one P of omega. Well, this is valid simply because uh, the semi-norm K plus one P of omega, the kernel of this object includes PK. So any function which is in PK has a zero K plus one semi-norm. So if I look at the, the K plus one semi-norm as an empty, uh, as, as an object that has a linear, uh, that has a zero uh, norm, what I would obtain here simply is that the norm of U plus Q, K plus one P omega is equal to the norm of U, K plus one P omega for any q in pk. And so in particular, uh, what you can say is that if you take the infimum on the right, uh, th this is actually true simply because the, the part of the norm that you have here on the k plus one, that you would get uh, k plus one zero. You, you would get zero on the left. Is that clear? Simply because Semi-norm Q, K plus one P omega is equal to zero for any Q just in PK. Okay. So of course, if I just take the semi-norm, this is uh, smaller or equal than the full norm by definition. So if I take the semi-norm K plus one U, uh, if I put U plus Q on the left here, this is equal to U. And of course, this is smaller or equal than that simply because the semi-norm is smaller or equal than the full norm. Okay, so this is trivial. The second inequality is much more complicated. Second inequality. So to prove the second inequality, one uses the following trick. Uh, we show that second inequality is equivalent to proving the following result. Okay, let's start by introducing a uh, operator PK. And let's define the space PK as the span of the basis functions VI for I that goes from one to N PK. Of course, this is going to be different according to the dimension, but uh, we know exactly what these are. And let's define VJ in PK dual such that dj of vi is equal delta ji, chronic and delta. The usual uh, norm, the usual pair of basis functions in pk and um, basis functions in pk and basis of the dual of pk. Now by Ambanak theorem, Banach extension theorem. Uh, there exist V tilde I in the dual space of VK plus one P of omega 
such that when you restrict V tilde I on Q, this is equal to VI of Q for any Q in BK. Okay. So I'm taking the extension V tilde I with the I on top of the dual basis functions that we had uh, that defines the dual object over here. And I define a projector pi k. It's a projector that goes from w k plus one p of omega with values in p k. Okay. In order to define this projector, of course, I cannot use directly v tilde i because if I use directly v tilde i, those are just objects in the dual space of v k. So I need to make sure that this are defined on the dual space of w k plus one p. Okay. And the way this is defined is that by taking u, I want to return the sum of v tilde i applied to u, v i. So let me explicitly write the sum here, even if this would be impl implied by the summation convention that we have over here. If you write it in this way, then this object is of course an object that lives on the space pk because it's a linear combinations of numbers times basis functions pi. Everything clear so far? Okay. So with this into place, the second inequality follows from proving the following thing, from proving uh, so the the bear with me for a second because this is a little bit uh, um, it, it's not trivial to understand at the beginning of not the first time. so it's 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 the second inequality comes from uh, showing that the semi-norm, well, the actual full norm of V, K plus one comma P comma omega, let's write this to the power P, is more or equal than a constant times um, the actual semi-norm to the power P, K plus one P omega, plus, and this is, where life becomes interesting. This is the sum over i of v tilde i. And let's use w here, uh, or actually u, because it's uh, otherwise I get confused. Uh, you'll get confused with the basis function, sorry. This is v tilde i applied to u to the power p. And uh, that's it, finished. So what I'm saying here, the second inequality follows by, by showing this, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why this is the case. And it's the case simply because the, the thing that you have on the right is a polynomial. And if you can choose the, if you can choose a polynomial that is equal to zero, when you take the interpolation of this guy, so if you subtract to you its projection, then these terms over here would be zero for a specific reason that I'll show you later on. Okay, let's so let's uh, let's first show that this is uh, that this is true. Okay, so one. So how do we show this? So one implies that there exists a constant c such that for any u we have. The inequality. I'll copy this. Oops. Start. Make it smaller. Put it here. And make it red. For any u, 
not for any u arbitrary, but for any u in w k plus one p. Okay. Let's prove this by contradiction. Proven by contradiction means the following. For any chi, for any constant C, there exists a, well, let me call it W, that depends on the constant C in W k plus one P of omega, uh, such that, Instead of having the inequality in this direction, we have the equality in the other direction. So we have that U, this is WC, P, K plus one P omega plus sum over I with the I of WC to the power P, uh, instead of, Saying that, I'm saying that this is smaller than C, okay? We can choose WC in such a way, if I, if I look at this object over here and I take uh, the norm of WC and I subtract the norm of WC and I divide the norm of WC for all these guys, I can actually select WC in such a way that there's a unit norm. So nothing changes in this inequality, right? So uh, if, if I prove this for functions that have one norm, K plus one P norm in omega equal to one, and this true, then I can, I can, uh, sorry, this, this was smaller equal than the, this was C here, and this was WC K plus one P omega. Okay. So to simplify my life, I can take something which is scaled with respect to the norm of WC, so I can divide everything by the norm of WC. And if I do this, this is actually valid with the norm of WC equal to one on the right and C uh, arbitrary on the left. So in other words, what I want to say here is I substitute, I take C to be equal to I in N for any number I in N. And what I'm saying here so in the intervals, zero, one, n. So for any real number, and I construct the sequence. So I'm saying that there exists a sequence. Sorry. So there exists a sequence WI such that the norm of WI K plus one P omega is equal to one and the limit for I that goes to infinity of W i k plus one p omega plus power p plus the sum of i j goes from i to j to n of w till the j of w i to the power p is equal to zero. 
Okay, so this two, this this uh, negating the fact that that is the same that that is true is the same as asking that there exists a sequence of functions that have unit norm. These objects here have unit norm such that the limit for w i semi norm plus this operator here, this object over here, is equal to zero. Okay. If I prove that this is true, then the inequality above cannot, cannot be true. So there cannot exist a constant such that uh, this is satisfied, okay? And of course, if there exists a constant such that this is satisfied, I can choose the, uh, I, I can actually show that there exists a particular choice of U minus P such that this is, uh, this is uh, um, uh, that, 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 that makes this equal to zero when I take u minus p, and then I can prove that u minus p on the left is equal is smaller equal than u minus p on the right. Okay, so I'll I'll, I'll show this uh, this later on. Okay, so there exists a sequence such that this is equal to zero, uh, and such that this limit is equal to zero. Okay, so how do we proceed? Well. The idea for this, the fact that there exists a sequence so that this is equal to zero uh, allows us to say two things. So first thing that, that we can say is that WK plus one P is continuously embedded in WKP, which means if I have a bounded sequence in WK plus one P out of omega, then there, is, there exists a strong, strongly convergent subsequence in WK. P of omega. Okay, so let's call the subsequence again WJ, WI, because it's a little bit simpler. Let's not introduce several indices, otherwise, uh, um, otherwise things don't, don't don't match. So there exists a W in WK P of omega such that. W i minus W goes to zero, okay? In W k p of omega. And moreover, what we can say is that uh, since this is the, the um, since it's strongly convergence to W k p, P, but we also have for hypothesis we also have the wi converges to zero and this is because this is what we asked in 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 this in this part of the hypothesis so we are saying that this is converging to zero and also this is WIK plus one P convergence to zero. So this is step A, step B, then A plus B implies that W belongs to actually WK plus one P and that the norm of WI minus W in the entire K plus one P goes to zero. Okay. Okay. So uh, now, what what can we say about this? The the say that the the, the the first points that I observe is that if I choose, if I look at B, implies that W, which is W K plus one P of omega belongs to PK of omega. This of course is true only if omega is connected. Okay. 
So since W belongs to, so what I'm saying is that if I take W k plus one P equals zero, this implies that W belongs to PK. So it's, if it's an object whose k plus one derivative is equal to zero, then it means it's a polynomial of order k. Is this clear? Okay. So what I'm suggesting now is that since this is equal to, uh, so the, the, the fact that wk plus one is equal to zero implies that w is in pk, in pk plus one, I'm asking that w k plus one, the full norm of wk plus one has to be equal to one for continuity of the norms. Okay. And the reason why I'm asking this is because wi k plus one p is equal to one for every i. So I'm saying, okay, the function w i k plus one has norm equal to one for every i. And the limit of these guys has to have norm equal to one by continuity of the norm. However, I know that the k plus one semi norm of w is equal to zero. So w needs to be an object which is in pk of omegas, okay? And now what I observe is that the hypothesis that I have over there is that uh, the W I K P norm. So I'm saying the semi norm is equal to zero. The norm has to be equal to one, but uh, the W K P uh, norm has to be equal to zero is zero because, and now we use the following results. So we have that we already know that this W I K plus, sorry, the W K plus one P norm plus We already know this because we asked exactly that the limit for i that goes to infinity of this is equal to zero. So this is what we asked by, by our hypothesis. So what we know is that the sum of these guys on w p is equal to zero, which implies in particular that w tilde j applied to w is equal to w Vj applied to W. And the reason why this is Vj applied to W is because W is a polynomial of order, of order PK. It's a polynomial in PK. And this is equal to zero for every J. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to say that this is equal to zero. Okay? So since I have this, this implies in particular that W I K, sorry, W K P is equal to zero. W semi norm K plus one P is equal to zero. And that the norm W K plus one P is equal to one, which is impossible. So I got a contradiction and the contradiction is that I cannot ask the W has norm equal to one and that the semi-norm K, so the norm K and the semi-norm K plus one are equal to zero both because this is exactly the sum of the two guys. So this is impossible. And this implies then that 
in particular, it implies that this must be true. Okay, because if this was false, then I could construct in such a way that this object would be equal to zero. That is, this object can go to zero for some wi that has a finite norm equal to one. Okay, so I can I can ask these two things at the same time if this was not the case. Okay, so what I'm saying here, if I look at this from the from the perspective of the uh, the final approximation thing, is then that the normal view. This is guy. This is the guy that it's written. So this is the implications that we had here. So this one, let me just copy it. And now I'll show that this is equivalent to asking. The Bramble Lieber Okay. So this implies in particular that if I take normal view plus Q P, so the infimum on P in capital uh, in, in PK. Okay, so this infimum is certainly smaller or equal than u plus, sorry, u minus pi k of u on p k plus one p uh, omega so to the power p k plus one p of omega. And we have just proven that this is smaller or equal than the semi norm of u p k plus one p omega, and there's no pi k because this pi k here has semi-norm k plus one p omega equal to zero, plus the sum over i of, this is v tilde i applied to u minus pi k of u p, and by construction, V tilde I applied to U minus pi K of U is equal to, now you look at this in this way, this is exactly equal by linearity to V tilde I applied to U minus, and now we apply the definitions of pi K of U. So V tilde I applied to pi K of U, this pi K of U would be V tilde J of u applied to um, v tilde i applied to vj. Okay. Is this passage clear? So this is V tilde J applied to PK of U and I define PK of U as V tilde J times VJ. So I can pass in, since this is linear, uh, this object is just a number. So I can just pass in V tilde J and apply V tilde J directly to the basis functions. And if I do it this way, this is exactly equal to V tilde I of U minus, this is delta IJ My construction. So this is exactly equal to B tilde I of U, which is equal, which is equal to zero. Okay. So by construction, what I'm saying here is that if I now take the infimum of all possible polynomials that are here, this infimum is controlled by the semi-norm of UP simply because I can make this part go away by choosing a particular polynomial that interpolates you using the interpolation of the basis functions that we just constructed. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
Yes, no, maybe. I think we have to digest it uh, yes. ourselves. Okay. So let's now apply this to our finite element interpolation approximation errors. So let's now take a look at how uh, we can construct the, um, how to estimate the, the interpolation on a single specific element. And let's see what are the consequences of this. Okay, now let's take omega. as a single element of our triangulations. Okay. And and we call this T for 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 simplicity. Okay. Now I would like to take a look at the the uh, trying to estimate u minus pi of u, and I would like to measure this in the norm uh, in, in a norm that I call m norm or the k norm, so it's s norm p t, and I would like to measure this in the s norm with respect to p t with the uh, results that we just pro pro produced now. So what we just defined now, what we just said now is that this, by what we constructed before, since this object is a object that has a kernel inside the polynomials, whenever you choose a polynomial u, the pi u is equal to u, so u minus pi u is equal to zero. What you could obtain here is that this is smaller or equal than the semi the norm of the i minus pi in the dual space. And now here we have just proven that this is smaller or equal than u uh, k plus one p t. Okay. Now the, the idea is that we would like to make sure we can use the results that we had in the change of norms and in the, in the change of Sobolev norms that we constructed before. Okay. So, so what is the principle here? So the principle here is that uh, I would like to basically estimate what is the role of this i minus pi in the in the uh, how to estimate the actual size of the i minus pi that is visible here. Okay. So let's start with the, with this, and let's take a look at what happens with the with the change of the coordinates that we have in in t. So let me just call u hat is u composed with f t. Let me call this f t simply, and I'm saying that t is equal to f of t hat. Okay, so I'm not using m not to confuse the notation anymore, okay? So F is the FM that was using before and T is a TM that I was using before. I don't want to add the M everywhere because otherwise life becomes, becomes very complicated. And I'm sure I'm going to confuse all the indices in K and S and P. So let's try to, to maintain this a little bit simpler if, well, if, if, if possible, okay? And so let's say also that I call pi hat of U hat, the uh, well, the, the same thing that we had before. So this is basically, I, I, you can write this as pi u composed with f. Okay, so you could write, I mean, you, you can write this as, a, as interpolation of pi hat of a function u hat, which is the u transformed through f, okay? I'm not going to prove this, but this is a trivial. If you, if, you, if you write it down, it's just going to be the same type of transformations applied to all the basis functions and we get exactly the same thing, okay? And now I would like to use what we have proven before. So what we have proven before is that you have that for any transformations that you have over here, 
So you have SPT. This transformation is smaller or equal. And now I move back to the U hat specs, the U tilde hat specs. Okay? So this is smaller or equal. If I go in this direction, then what I have is I have raw. Uh, I'm not writing M here. It's simply the, the raw of the T. So, so let, let me write this row T to the minus S. This is the, the size of which I have on the left. And this is J to the one half, uh, one over P. And I'm applying the definition that I had before. And now if I'm looking at this, this is the norm of U minus pi U S P. T hat, and this is U hat by hat, U hat, okay? And now the principle that I have here is that I would like to uh, move this to the LK plus one norm, okay? And now I would like to apply the results that we had uh, that we just couldn't have written for the Bramble-Hilbert lemma. And for the Bramble Hilbert lemma, what we what we want what we want to compute here is that uh, this this can be written as the uh, you you can write this. Let me just uh, rewrite this on the bottom. So this becomes raw. T to the minus S, and then I get uh, from the passage to the uh, Bramble Hilbert lemma, I would have here K plus one PT hat. And now I can go back to the uh, U on, on, on T. So in order to go back from U of T, uh, I have to make sure that I use as the change in the sublet forms, the ones that appear over here. And what I have obtained is then I get HT to the power K plus one. And the j to the, to the minus p gets simplified with the j that is uh, to the power p over here. And uh, what I'm left is simply the seminorm u, k plus one, p, t. And this is the single most important result of finite element analysis. And this is the reason why these guys are so powerful. Okay, so the way to remember this from the mnemonic point of view is whatever it's on the right is with the positive power and whatever is on the left, it's with the negative power on the estimate. And of course, if, if I have a negative power, I cannot put H because H is the upper estimate. I have to be a lower estimate, which is raw, which over here. And here is where life becomes interesting if you have quasi-regular triangulations. So for quasi-regular triangulations, quasi-uniform triangulations. We call H is the maximum over M of HM, and we called rho, which is the minimum over M of rho M. And uh, what we know is also that uh, for every M, we have that rho M uh, is actually greater equal than sigma times HM. And if this is true with sigma in the interval, of course, zero one, The greater the sigma, the better it is, of course. This cannot be, cannot be one in particular because you cannot put the circle unless you have 
uh, balls as your finite element spaces, you cannot do that. So sigma has to be uh, certainly smaller than one and uh, it should not be zero. So if it's zero, then life doesn't like, it doesn't come very easily. So for, for those guys, what you would get here is that all of the terms that you see in the estimate will depend on the shape regularity by this condition. And this we, this we were discussing at some point. So we know that this is greater or equal than sigma um, HM. So when I take the inverse of this guy, I know that this is more or equal than, than sigma to the power minus S. And this becomes H to the power K plus one minus S. And you have U K plus one. P, T, and this sigma, if this sigma is independent on the triangulation, then this is usually the estimate that you find on various books of finite element methods. Okay, so if this sigma is constant and only depends uh, on the, it's a, it, it, it's a value that tells you what is the quality of the triangulation. So in a certain sense, if your triangulation degenerates, what you would see is that the error estimates that you get degenerate in the, in the same way. So question so far. No? Uh, I have a question, um, not a question. I, I, yes. I, wanted to, I want to know if, um, let's say the, the term that you mentioned in the, in the beginning is implemented in the, the final element library. Let's say that, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, if, no. I, if uh, the, this one is implemented in the, in, the, in, the, in the library that you are using. Uh, you mean this interpolation estimator, this object over here? Yes. Yes, this is implemented there. It's called interpolation. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the, the, the idea is that uh, if you, I mean, this coincides with the classical interpolation. Uh, if you have defined, uh, so, so far I haven't defined the, the basis functions that I'm using for this finite element approximation space, right? So the only uh, assumptions that I asked is that the, sp the space that I'm using PK can be constructed using a set of basis functions. And I can define a dual set of basis functions such that the canonical sets, the canonical things are satisfied. So the dual basis are defined such that when you apply them to VI, you get delta JI. So however you choose your basis functions, then the operator that I defined over here is a projection operator. Since you apply twice, you get the same, you, you get the same results. So pi k square is equal to pi k. And in particular, if you see this as a Lagrange basis function, so if you apply this to the Lagrange basis functions, then pi k is the interpolation operator, which is a projection in the sense, in the mathematical sense. It's a projection because if you apply it twice, you get the same as applying it once. Okay, and this operator as we defined it here, with VI being the Lagrange basis functions. So that means the V capital J on top being the uh, evaluation at the support point J. This is exactly the interpolate functions of the DO2 library. So we have this in the library and this is called uh, the vector tools interpolate. We will see this uh, in the next lectures as a way to provide initial data or as a way to provide interpolation boundary data or finite element functions. Does that make sense? Yes, 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 it makes sense. Okay, so let's uh, let's go for a second here. I mean, I've, I've said many things. So this is a lot to digest. And uh, I, I would like to uh, apply this to finite element method to, to our classical method and to show you the final result. And so the final result is that you apply this for every TN. And you would like to make sure that this estimate is valid for any TM. So for example, let's go to the specific and let's take A, which is the weak Laplacian. So we, we say A U V defined as the integral of omega of the gradient of U times the gradient of V. 
And let's say, for example, that fv is equal to the integral of omega of fv in d omega. And let's say that f is a function which is in L2 of omega, okay? So if the function f is in L2 of omega and uh, the domain omega is regular enough, so for omega Lipschitz and convex, then we know from the theory that u should belong to H2 of omega intersected with H10 of omega. And of course, we say V is equal to H10 of omega. So this is the classical Poisson problem that we have been solving in the, in the example lecture, in the example that we had uh, last time. Oh, by the way, uh, I've, I've been asked for a, a couple of hours or an hour or some time to get it to solve some problems. And, and this will be on, on Thursday. So the day after tomorrow, after the lecture in the morning, in the afternoon at two, I will be available for, for you for, for all problems you may have with the current exercises, okay? Um, I will have to send the mail to Yogesh because I think he was also another one of us to focus. So once I have this, what I can say is, uh, since the solution is in H2 of omega, I can apply bramble hilbert lemma. And what I can expect is the following. Uh, I know that from, from, from here, implies the orthogonality of the error, which is Seas lemma. So wh what I can say is that A of U minus UH VH is equal zero. And in particular, this also implies that if I take U minus UH and I take the, now let's be specific about this. So this is the uh, H1 norm of this guy. So with the notations that we had before, this would be one omega. So U minus UH one omega is more or equal than alpha, sorry, this was the norm of A star divided by alpha, which now in particular case are equal to one. So this guy over here is equal to one in our particular case that we showed above. But what we can say here is that this is equal to the infimum for VH in capital VH of U minus VH for one omega, okay? And now here is exactly where I want to apply the results that we just had. So if I proceed with this inequality, then what I can say is the following. And this is more or equal than U minus pi of u, one omega. And uh, let, me, let me just keep the inequalities, the, the, the constant that I have there, because these are useful to show where life becomes complicated, okay? And now I can apply bramble hilbert lemma to this guy over here. And bramble hilbert lemma to this guy must be applied separately on each one of the domain. Okay, so if I apply this separately on each one of the TM, I get exactly the sum of these guys over, over every single T. Now, if I have chosen uh, H to be the maximum over OM, and I suppose that this is satisfied for every sigma, what I obtain is exactly something that does not depend on new H anymore, but it only depends on you. And let me then keep going with this. This is more or equal to the norm of A star over alpha. And now here, what I have is that I, I should write sigma to the minus one 
because this is minus s and I have one on the left, sigma to the minus s, and I should write here h to the power one plus one minus one. That will be k plus one minus one, and this would be u, let me write this directly as two minus one, semi norm u two omega. Okay. And now the reason why I can do this is the following. I can do this for the following thing. I can say that u, so pi of u belongs to the h and pi of u is just gluing together all the, all the various uh, uh, interpolation functions on, on the various, on, on the various segments, right? So I can write pi, the global pi of u now is the sum over m of the sum over j and the sum over, and so all, all of the sums we have here, basically. The sum over capital I and little j, and this is P M I J of B tilde. Now this becomes a little bit more complicated to write, but uh, this is exactly what would happen uh, for in, inside the computer for with the functions that, that does this for you. So let's write this correctly. So this would be the V tilde I, uh, uh, the hat tilde J applied to U composed So I can, I can either apply this to U composed F, M, or I can apply uh, the FM inverse and then apply the V tilde applied to that. So depending on how you write this, this is U composed FM, and then you apply V tilde J of this guy. And this should be applied to V tilde J composed with FM minus one. Okay. And of course, if I, if I look at it in this way, V tilde J composed of FM minus one, what, what you want to have is that you would like to have the extension by zero of these guys. And so I don't know exactly how to write this extension. Uh, so this is the extension. By zero. And this guy here instead is the Hanbanak. Extension, okay. So this is the definition of the pi. And of course, if you want to do this uh, explicitly, you're going to get uh, a lot of details uh, that, are, that needs to be taken right. But it all boils down to the following, is that you can write the norm of u minus pi of u, and you can write this as the sum over m of one tm. And the reason why you can do this is simply because if you have a function which is in H1, then its H1 norm is equal to the sum of the H1 norms on each one of the subdomains. And you don't need to take care of, of gluing those things together, okay? And if you have this, then what, what would happen on the right is that you have this H star over alpha, sigma to the minus one, and this would be H to the power one, semi-norm. And of course, you, you write the same thing here on the right, this would be the sum over, over M, of u to tm 
and, and you're basically summing all of the things uh, for each one of the elements. And uh, when you do this uh, summing all on, on the things for each one of the elements, you get exactly the estimated result on top over here. Of course, this can be done because what's written on the left is included in, in BH and is included in capital V. So you, it, takes sense, it makes sense to write this in terms of capital V. However, even if you have a approximation which is not in capital V and you want to estimate higher order norms, and you know, for example, that the solution is in a higher order space, you can still do the same type of estimate, but just locally and do the broken semi-norm on each one of the sub-entries because the sub-entries in your pi of U is C infinity on each one of the sub elements and U as the regularity of U. So if you know that U has higher regularity, then you can actually estimate higher semi norms as long as you break them across each element and you look at, the, at what happens on each element. So in general, in general, you can say that the sum over m of the u minus pi of u this is uh, s tm is more or equal you still have a sorry uh, this doesn't contain the a star this only contains the the estimate on the interpolation and again, this doesn't contain the estimate on a star, just the estimate on the population. This is sigma to the minus one, h to the power k plus one minus s, seminor u k plus one omega. So what I'm saying is that you can split the thing if you know that u is more regular, So this inequality is valid for, for every U which is in HK plus one of omega and for any S which is more or equal than K, okay? So you can apply bramble Hilbert lemma to this, even though the regularity on the left is not the full S norm. So if you have, for example, that you know that the solution is in H3, what you would obtain is that you can also obtain a, an estimate on the H2 norm on the left with respect to the H3 norm on the right, provided that you break the H2 norm on the left on each one of these objects. Okay, and this is true for the interpolation estimator. So the interpolation will converge with the correct semi-norm, and even if the global space uh, doesn't have, is not included in the space capital VH. Okay. I'm not, Maybe I'm not making this very clear, but uh, this is the local estimate that one has. And this is in general, it's different. U minus pi of U S T M is not the norm of U minus pi of U S sum over m of this, uh, sorry, uh, this on the entire domain omega, because you have to guarantee that you have uh, continuity across the boundaries as well uh, of the various uh, objects. For example, if you want to have uh, H2 objects, you have to make sure that the, so the function itself is C1 continuous across boundary elements. So you can control the H1, the H the H2 semi-norm locally, but not uh, identify the sum of the local estimate of the H2 semi-norms with the global H2 norm, okay? The, the equality is old. Holds for all HS included in the H. And in particular, for example, H1 is included in the, uh, sorry, for all HS such that BH 
is included in HS, sorry. And so unless the H is not included in HS, you cannot write this as an equality. You only have the inequality. So the global estimate that we have here tells you that if you look at the finite element method that we just implemented, we should be able to see, and this is going to be a subject of the next uh, lecture on finite elements. So on the next lecture on Thursday, it will tell us that uh, the error that you commit when you take the interpolation of the function has to go down whenever you choose a smaller grid size. So if you take smaller triangles or smaller quadrilaterals, and so you make h, h go to zero, if this will go down with a power which is as large as the regularity of the function u that you see. And of course, there's, there's several ingredients in this estimate. So the first ingredient in the estimates is the following. So this is a k plus one here on the right, and there's a minus s here. And the k that is written here is the one that is used for the polynomial approximation. So if you know that the solution you have is regular, more regular, for example, than H2, because this would be K plus one. Uh, so for example, if you only had H1 regularity, you can only control the H1 error up to a power one on, on, on the size of the triangulation. If you know that the solution is more regular, so for example, you know that the, it's a C infinity function or it's a harmonic function. So for example, if you solve the eigenvalue problem and any eigenvectors is the C infinity function. So it's, it's, um, it's as regular as you want. So those guys over here, uh, you know that they converge with the norm, which is arbitrary here on the right. So in order to see higher order convergence, it makes sense to go higher with the K that you use in the approximation space, which means it means it, it's uh, advantages to increase the polynomial degree of approximation, if and only if you know that the solution is regular up to order K plus one. If you know that that is true, then going higher with K increases exponentially the speed at which you converge to your exact solution, because the exponent here will depend to will depend uh, from K, which is the, the polynomial approximation order that you're using on, your, on every single element. So here, what I'm saying is simply, is that you, you get rid of the errors that you make provided you measure the polynomial order with K plus one on the right here. Is it clear? Yes, about this uh, last thing you said. Um, yes. In the last set of uh, uh, exercises, uh, <clears throat> in the last point you said to, I mean, uh, you wanted us to observe the order of convergence, right, for the L-shaped domain. Yes. But uh, I observed, uh, I mean, uh, a loss of convergence, I think, right, because uh, you don't have, um, uh, I mean, with that shape domain, you have the singularity on the corner, right? Absolutely. So yes. in, that, in that case, uh, we can't apply this, right? And you have- the, the thing that you cannot apply is that uh, in, in that case, uh, the K that you see here is not an integer, it's a fractional. Right, object. okay, so you have to, to use a fraction on the sample of space, right, all that stuff. Yes, exactly, exactly, exactly. Oh, okay. And this is valid for also for fractional solar spaces. This is very interesting because any of these answers that I've written here, you can apply this to interpolation spaces as well. So as soon as you prove a result of this type for regular functions u, then you can apply the same result to any interpolation space between the two. So I'm not going into too many details, but you can see intermediate spaces between hk plus one and h zero, for example, with the real numbers using the real interpolation between uh, sublim spaces, the real method for interpolating between sublim spaces. And what you would get is a fraction here that follows exactly the same type of powers that you have written here. So if you prove this for integer case, for some case, then it's also valid for all intermediate case, provided that you use as intermediate uh, spaces when you look at this. Uh, objects over here, the uh, real interpolation spaces between between the two. Okay, so it's correct that if I increase the uh, degree of the polynomial, uh, from for instance, from one to two, I observe, for instance, uh, uh, 1.5 convergence. Yes, and it is exactly 25. correct. 
Okay. It is exactly correct. And the reason why it is exactly correct is because uh, whenever you, you, I mean, the assumptions that we have over here is that the exact solution is in UK plus one. What I didn't write uh, and probably I should have. So this is uh, in the application of this to the finite element method. Here, if you, so there's a, there's a detail that I wrote here. And that the detail that I wrote here is that if omega is Lipschitz and convex, then U is in H2 intersected with H10. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. If it's Lipschitz and convex, then what you can say in reality, there's a little bit more that you can say about this. The regularity of the of the of the of the boundary of the domain tells you what is the maximum regularity that you can obtain on your on your solution. No? And uh, the convexity also tells you what is the maximum regularity that you obtain. In reality, the, if you have a, a non-convex polynomial, but still Lipschitz, so if you have something which, with acute angles, uh, what you can show is that there is going to be a regularity U, which is, in, which is going to be in HR, where R depends on the angles that you have. And the R is exactly equal to one half for angles which are 90 degrees. So if you have a, a corner, which is of 90 degrees, this R is going to be a two minus one half. Okay, yes. And this okay. is going to deteriorate. It's going to deteriorate. Uh, so if you have, for example, an angle that goes like this and the domain is in this, in, in, in this, in this side, then this, uh, the fraction of the angle that you have over here is going to make uh, less and less regularity of that. Okay, yes. Okay, yes, because okay. also there we had uh, the I mean, yeah, homogeneous DDK, I think. Yes, having homogeneous DDK ha helps a little bit, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't improve the fact that the solution is no longer H2 intersected with H10 if you don't have convexity. So the convexity gives you the boosting regularity that you have. So for, in particular, one, one can show the following thing. If it's convex, then you can say that uh, this particular problem is too regular. So F in HS implies U in HS plus two. If you don't have the two regularity, and this is the two regularity is lacking, so you don't have this anymore if the domain is no more complex. Okay, okay, it makes sense. Thank you. So this will be a little less than two regular, it will be one and a half regular for the particular corner case. So if you have H in HS, U is not going to be H2, it's going to be H uh, one, one half, one plus one half, so H three halves. In particular. And of course, if you see that U is in H3 halves, you can still apply this and you will see that this is going to be just three halves because it's, you cannot apply this for higher regularity because the U is no longer, be, is no longer going to be more, more regular than H3 halves. And you will get here a three halves minus one is equal to one half. So in the H1 norm, you get one half regularity. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, thank you. Okay, any more questions? Okay, so let's, uh, let's stop here for, for, for this time. And uh, let, me, let me block the...